And shortly after that, Hughes resigns, and Secretary of State is Frank Kellogg, who um, no one continues as Secretary of Treasury, of course. He wasn't, of course, well known as Hughes. But Kellogg was a, um, a, a lawyer from St. Paul, St. Paul, Minnesota. He was general counsel for U.S. Steel, which, of course, is a, Morgan, a top Morgan company. He was also a lawyer for, for J, James J. Hill's various invest, railroad investments. And remember, Hill started from Minnesota. And uh, the Great Northern Hill was allied with the Morgan, closely allied with the Morgans at this point. So he was uh, a, a Morgan lawyer, also a, Hill from, a lawyer for Hill personally. Um, as Under Secretary of State, so Kellogg is definitely a Morgan person. As Under Secretary of State, uh, he wanted to get Morrow, the Morrow Morgan partner. Actually, Morrow wound up heading up the Latin American desk, at least unofficially. He's really sort of heading up Latin American foreign policy all during the 20s. Uh, so Morrow was a Morgan partner. He couldn't, Morrow refused, and he finally got Joseph C. Grew, who was a career diplomat. On the Secretary of State, who later became ambassador to Japan under Roosevelt. Um, Joseph C. Grew is a career diplomat. He's also, his cousin married the son of J.P. Morgan. Also, a good thing to do if your cousin marries the son of J.P. Morgan, I'll tell you that. And um, so, he's, again, definitely a Morgan person. And uh, during the Coolidge administration, as I say, Dwight Morrow became more or less virtually head of the, of the Latin American desk in relationship with Nicaragua and so forth. And another Morgan person became uh, Morgan attorney. Actually, became head of the, of the of another part of Latin American desk. So, um, and indeed, when uh, when Roosevelt went to war with Japan, Joseph C. Grew was the ambassador to Japan. He's the only person in the State Department to be against the war with Japan in favor of a negotiated peace. Because I will contend in a minute, Grew was a uh, the Morgans were not in favor of war in Asia. Didn't have any investments in Asia. Didn't care about it. And therefore, in favor of peace. Uh, in Asia. At any rate, in the 1924 campaign, as I think I mentioned, I'll just sum up again, when Coolidge ran for re-election in 24, uh, the Democrats, there was a big fight for the Democratic nomination between William G. McAdoo, the guy who had been Wilson Secretary of Treasury, and Morgan Person. Morgan's loved McAdoo. He was the Morgan candidate. And the Ku Klux Klan candidate. He was then and moved to California. He was backed by the Ku Klux Klan and the Pietists. Because one thing I forgot to mention already is the Prohibition, of course, came in with World War I on the, on the ground, on the cover of the, the war effort and save our soldiers from the sin of alcohol. And so in the hysteria of that, they passed the Prohibition Amendment. So the Prohibition was not only illegal by federal law, it was also unconstitutional. All liquor of any sort, even wine, was then was unconstitutional to have it, possess it, or sell it, or whatever. So even though it came in on the Democrats, uh, the Republicans were all for it, being pietists anyway. Demo the Southern Democrats were all for it, being pietists by now. And the only opponents were like, you know, Catholic, Northern Catholics and Irish Catholics and whatever. So in the 1924 convention, Democratic convention, McAdoo represented the prohibitionist forces and the Ku Klux Klan, which is very strong in the 1920s everywhere, not just in the South, running on an anti-Catholic ticket. Uh, and... Uh, and anti-Catholics are sinful because they drink liquor. It all again begins to fit in. The whole thing is, comes up again. And uh, Al Smith, <clears throat> an Irish Catholic, running for governor of New York, running for the presidential nomination, as a northern Catholic candidate, so to speak, anti-prohibition. And uh, it was an hysterical convention. It went to 104 ballots. And, uh, and it was in New York. It was about 90, it was 100 degrees. It you know, lasted for a week. No air conditioning. And total hysteria takes over, and the, the Southern Pietists and, and the Irish Catholics in, in New York practically at, 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 virtually at sword's point. And finally, as a compromised candidate, since neither could get two thirds, those days Democrats to win the Democratic nomination had that two thirds vote. They pick a compromised candidate, John W. Davis, from the corporate law firm of Davis, Polk, and Wardwell, the major Morgan law firm in the country. In other words, John W. Davis is the chief partner of a top Morgan law firm. <clears throat> as a compromise candidate between Morgan's McAdoo and Smith. So he had in 1924 the lovely prospect from the Morgan point of view of both candidates being Morgan people. Coolidge a Morgan person, Davis a Morgan person. Tight Morgan people. They couldn't lose whoever won. Uh, they don't often have that. It's sort of a lovely situation for them, at least. Uh, <clears throat> Attorney General under uh, Coolidge was Harlan Fisk Stone, who was a dean of Columbia Law School. And his law partner was a... Um, Progressive 
Separate. His war partner was Herbert Satterley, who was the son-in-law of J.P. Morgan. Uh, so, so, you, so again, a Morgan person. So we have, in other words, in a, under Coolidge, we have an entire Morgan cabinet from top to bottom, uh, open, open Morgan control. And Strong, of course, running the Fed, inflating in the Fed as a Morgan policy there. Okay, in 1928, we will get, um, by the way, the assistant secretary, they, they set up a new assistant secretary for air in the War Department. Air now, airplanes now coming in. They have the first air secretary, F. Truby Davison, was the brother of Henry P. Davison, Morgan partner. So we have the Morgan control of the airway, and everything else. So the, the Coolidge administration was a total Coolidge administration from top to bottom. Um, when Hoover comes in, uh, so who is Hoover? Hoover himself was a self-made millionaire, he was a mining engineer and geologist, uh, going all over the world, Asia and Australia, etc., prospecting mining properties and promoting them. Then he settled in London. People don't know too much about him. He's done the food czar, of course, in World War One and Wilsonian. Uh, so he himself was an independent millionaire in a sense. He wasn't dominated by people. On the other hand, he was. He was close to the Morgans. As he spoke when he when he got into as president in 1928. He spoke regularly three times a week to Dwight Morrow. Once again, key person, Morgan partner. Anybody who speaks three times a week to Dwight Morrow is definitely in the Morgan ambit. Coolidge was, in other words, Morrow was Coolidge's main guru and whatever control, if you want to call it that, the spy language, uh, and also Hoover checked with him all the time. Clear it with, with Morrow. He was also a good friend, uh, Hoover of Thomas W. Lamont, Morgan partner. So uh, basically what we have with Hoover is a continuation of the Hoover, of the, of the Morgan administration. Uh, Secretary of State, succeeding uh, Hughes and then Kellogg, was Henry Simpson, who was a Morgan person from way back, corporate lawyer, disciple of Elihu Root, Morgan person. So Simpson now comes, comes as Secretary of State. Uh, Secretary of Treasury continues to be Mellon, again, of course, is a, again, an ally with at least uh, Morgan. And uh, Hoover didn't, was not very fond of Mellon personally, didn't get along too well, so he gets in as Under Secretary of Treasury. Uh, he gets a uh, Ogden Mills, who was a Morgan person, whose father was a um, director of New York Central Railroad, Morgan Railroad, and Southern Pacific Morgan Railroad. That's Ogden Mills Sr. Ogden Mills Jr. He's the guy who's under Secretary of Treasury now, under Hoover, under Secretary. In other words, succeeding Gilbert goes on to become Morgan Partner. I guess his reward in heaven is Morgan Partner. Mills uh, himself was on a board of Atchison Peak and Santa Fe, which is Morgan Railroad, and New York Trust Company, another Morgan company. Um, so, uh, now Stimson himself was a... Um, had been was closely allied, not as a Morgan lawyer, Secretary of State under Hoover. We have Hoover as a Morgan ambit. We have Simpson, Secretary of State, Morgan person. Simpson comes in to be Secretary of War under Roosevelt when World War II, and under Truman, Roosevelt and Truman, and World War II comes in as uh, part of the great World War II alliance. Uh, and uh, so Stimson is a was closely connected with a with a Wall Street investment firm, bond firm, Bonbright and Company. Two of Stimson's cousins, Alfred Loomis and Landon Thorne, were both directors of Bonbright and Company, big shot, actually as high officials of Bonbright, and they were both also directors of Bankers Trust Company, which is a big Morgan company, of course, uh, where Storm comes from. So the Bonbright Company is very close to the Morgan interest, really Morgan run. And Bankers Trust. And then we have two, two cousins of Stimson closely linked up with the Morgan Bonbright Bankers Trust interest. And Morgan and Simpson himself was a Morgan lawyer. Uh, Simpson brought in as his assistant Secretary of State. By this time, there's now assistant as well as under secretary. He brought in Harvey Bundy, who was a director of the AT&T, also in the, in the uh, Morgan ambit. So he brings in as his disciple Harvey Bundy. Who later, later sires two famous brothers, McGeorge Bundy, his two sons, McGeorge Bundy, who became more or less foreign policy head under, I think, Lyndon Johnson. And his son, his brother, William Bundy, became editor of Foreign Affairs, the, the, the big establishment foreign affairs 
Journal of the Council of Foreign Affairs. In other words, we have a generation, and we had also Atchison, who becomes a disciple of Stenson later. So we, Atchison, Dean Atchison, we have a whole gener three, gener four generations of Morgan types running on foreign policy. We had Elihu Root, and his disciple Stimson, right? And Stimson's disciple, Atchison and Harvey Bundy, and Harvey Bundy's sons, McGeorge Bundy and William Bundy. So we had a whole, in other words, stretching from 1900 or 1902 until 1960s and 70s, the same gang running American foreign policy, and basically the same principles. All Morgan people. Um, but George Bunny is now a Harvard or eminent Harvard type. I think, I don't know if I think William is no longer the editor of Foreign Affairs, at any rate. Close in there. And uh, Secretary of the Navy was Charles Francis Adams of the Adams family under Hoover. Um, close to the Morgans from way back as a Boston Brahmin. Uh, son of Charles Francis Adams, the railroad tycoon, remember from earlier in the term, uh, and a, himself, a, uh, whose daughter, Charles Francis Adams Jr.'s daughter, married J.P. Morgan Jr. So, a very tight, <laughs> very tight Morgan connection there for the Navy Department. So, uh, again with Hoover, continuing Coolidge, we have a, a more or less straight Morgan administration. Um, a couple of his friends were in there, didn't seem to be connected with anybody particularly. The president of Stanford, who was an old chum of Hoover, became Secretary of Interior. Hoover was Stanford's first famous graduate, and so uh, there's always been a Hoover and Stanford connection. In 1929, of course, the big the Great Depression hit uh, the United States, and in 1931, the rest of the world. <coughs> and um, you know, I can only just state here what the cause was. I've already sort of alluded to it. Basically, it was the fact that. Uh, Great Britain, after the war, wanted, after World War One, wanted to restore its uh, financial preeminence. Decided in order to do that, they had to go back to the, all, the whole world had to go back to the gold standard, but to a different kind of gold standard. It's really going on to another kind, namely a gold standard, which a very peculiar kind, which keeps the form of the gold standard without much of the content, in which the United States has remained on the gold standard at, at uh, with a dollar fixed at one twentieth of a gold ounce, and the British went back to the old pound, which essentially used to, used to be $4.87 approximately. Um, and, and even though, because of inflation during the World War I, the British pound had gone down by about 1920 to about $3.20, in other words, had inflated even more than the dollar. The dollar doubled, the money supply of dollars more or less doubled during the war. All the other countries went way beyond that because they were largely because they were in the war for four years, and the United States was only in the war for a year and a half. So they inflated a lot more. Went off the gold standard in World War I, and tried to go back uh, to a gold standard, which, on which, first of all, on which the British pound was re-evaluated upward to 487. I mean, totally insane way of doing it. And that's that the British, in order to keep its goods competitive, would have had to deflate by whatever this is, 20, 25, or 30%. In other words, contract the supply, but if that uh, 487, the uh, British goods are much too expensive in terms of every, all other products. So in order to make the British goods competitive, they would have had to deflate the domestic price level down to, you know, whatever it is, the same proportion of mass. Um, it's kind of a nutty thing to do because they could have gone back to the old standard of 320, just thrown in the towel and said, okay, we'll have to re we recognize reality, we go back to the old standard of a, a devalued pound. But they felt their prestige was at stake, and they uh, couldn't afford to do that. Also, some of the bondholders in England were insisting on, on getting their speculative uh, profits. In other words, you buy, you buy pounds at, at 320, you hold on to them, they go up to 487, they're worth a lot more. So with the combination of economic vested interests of the financial of the creditors, the banker, creditor, bondholder types, Along with the, uh, the view of the British prestige and reestablishing the financial dominance of London requires going back to 487. Um, essentially, they did something like that after the Napoleonic Wars of 1819, but the only, only, they only went back by, they only had about 10% to go instead of about 30%. And also, in those days, prices could fall. There were no unions, there was no inflationary policy, permanent inflationary policy to keep prices up. And Britain in the 1920s, first of all, had very strong unions by this time. Largely because, and also the union wage rate structure was held up largely by a vast uh, system of unemployment insurance the English had put in around World War I, um, which, which uh, gave almost unlimited benefits at almost 
uh, working uh, worker wage rates. In other words, if you got unemployed, you get but well, it's not, but you know, got a huge, huge unemployment insurance, huge payments, which kind of keep them permanently unemployed. In other words, keep the wage rate, the union wage rate structure way above free market wage rates. So in that kind of an atmosphere, they would, have, the English government would, have had, if they wanted to deflate, they started with the idea we have to go back to gold standard 487. Uh, then they would have to do with the deflate. They weren't prepared to do that. In fact, they wanted to keep inflating because they they liked the idea of cheap credit and all the rest of it, keep union wage rates high. So here they insist on inflating at the time when their whole position would have required them to deflate very heavily. And that kind of, a, given those assumptions, they did a brilliant tactical job of trying to work within this, these two crazy assumptions. Um, basically what they try to do is to force the other countries to go back to the gold standard at a overvalued whatever it is, Pengo, Bulgar, or, you know, whatever the currencies are. England was essentially running Europe after World War I through the League of Nations, which it controlled. And the Financial Committee of the League of Nations, which was staffed by Bank of England and Bank of England types. Uh, so they forced these other countries, they twisted their arm to go back to set up the central bank in each country and to inflate and also to overvalue the exchange rate of these countries so to stimulate British exports and restrict imports into Britain. Uh, they couldn't do that with the United States. The United States was much too powerful. They couldn't force us to do anything. So with the United States, which was on a gold, the idea, on the other thing they did is they set up a gold exchange standard Instead of a gold standard, whereby these other countries are encouraged to pyramid not on top of gold but on top of pound sterling, so that whenever in other words, they keep their sterling balances and don't cash them in in London, don't cash them in for gold, even though London was technically on a gold standard, everybody was encouraged to keep on the pound standard. The result is that Britain pyramided pounds on top of gold, kept inflating. The other, as, and in the old days, they would have lost pounds to France and uh, Germany and whatever, and Bulgaria, etc. They would have lost gold on them because pounds would have, would have piled up. They would have called upon England for redemption. Now they didn't call upon England for redemption. They kept, they kept sterling balances, in other words, pound balances. And they pyramided on top of that. Each of these countries were encouraged to pyramid the Pengo, the Bulgar, whatever the names are, on top of pounds. You had a very top-heavy inflationary structure during the 20s. Uh, the United States was on gold, so they put on top of dollars and gold, the United States was on gold. So it was important then for the, the British to avoid losing, the British began to lose gold to the, to the United States. And France, France refused to go along with this either after the mid-twenties. France went back to the gold standard on a not devalued, uh, a regular franc. So Britain started losing gold to France, uh, sterling balances in gold, and, and the United States. So they try to get so the, 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 the game of the United States was to try to induce the United States to inflate itself so to keep Britain from losing gold to it. So if we inflated parallel with the British, and this is what we did. Benjamin Strong, the head of the Federal Reserve System, the president, governor of Federal Reserve back in New York, then there was president of Federal Reserve in New York, I think, had a secret deal with Montague Norman, who was the head of the Bank of England, uh, famous Strong Norman connection. They would visit each other a lot. They'd they go under assumed names to the Riviera and to Saratoga, which in those days was a big spa, summer resort. They have secret conferences, the purport, the, the, the brunt of which was that the United States should, it should inflate, the Fed should pump money and credit in, so it's to inflate lower interest rates in the United States, inflate prices, and keep the, the British from losing gold. We did that three times in 1921, 24, and 27, giving some strong sort of the coup de whiskey to the stock market. Of this to keep it keep it going, keep it bubbling. Strong and Norman, as strong as we know, was a Morgan Morgan ambit all of his life. Montague Norman was heavily Morgan Morgan connected, um, and um, Montague Norman was a had, was uh, himself a grew up. His mother and father were both old, old time banking families. His mother was connected with the Brown brothers. Uh, family, which is now Brown Brothers Harriman, a big Wall Street banking firm. He himself worked in New York, Norman, as, as a youth, the Brown Brothers uh, institution. So these are all very closely connected. And of course, the Morgans were the fiscal agent of the Bank of England. So we had a strong Morgan connection between Strong and Norman. Uh, there was a lot of, some historians are claiming there's some kind of peculiar psychological bond between Strong and Norman, perhaps psychosexual bond. Uh, my contention is you don't have to postulate any of this because the Morgan tie was enough. <laughs> it was enough to bind them. Anyway, the result of all this was to keep money inflated, to have a phony gold standard, more or less. 
uh, especially for Europe. And the result of this final, final, final collapse, as the, the whole thing came toppling down uh, with unsound investments, with calls upon the banks of the United States for redemption, bank failures, and all the rest of it. So during the, during the, and during the great, and, and, and by the way, 1931, when the banking crisis hit Europe and various big banks began to fail, because all banks are inherently bankrupt. All banks are fractional reserve banks and really uh, can be doomed at any moment. When they began to fail that time, the British, having pushed everybody else into this wacko system, which overinflated, went off the gold standard very quickly at a very low interest rate. After telling everybody else, I'll never go back off the gold standard, please keep your sterling balances in London. Suddenly, one fine day, they're out of it, they're off it. Thereby precipitating a general European financial crisis which lasted through World War II. So we have the point then that everybody's now off the gold standard. Every, all, all currencies were, free, were fluctuating and fly at but also control, control exchange rates, competitive devaluation to try to push your exports and prevent the other guy's import. Uh, what was known as beggar your neighbor policies. Keynes called beggar your neighbor. Keynes was in favor of it. I mean, that's a pretty good description of European currency blocks during, during the 1930s. The United States was what went off the gold standard in 33, uh, except for international uh, payments and for domestic accounts that went off it, basically off it. So what we have is a world of currency blocks, tariffs, high tariffs, and all the rest of it, economic warfare all during the 30s. Uh, part of the major, one of the major reasons for the war with Germany, between the United States, England, and Germany, was economic and financial. Uh, all, these, all these countries had devalued. In other words, England went off the gold standard, devalued the pound. The United States devalued the dollar from 120th to 135th of the gold ounce. Germany couldn't be devalued. Politically impossible for them to devalue. Germany had a runaway inflation in 1923, a result of continuing expansion of the money supply, creation of bank money and paper money. And the German public blamed the foreign exchange market. They're not blaming the quantity of money, because that's a pretty arcane process. What the German public saw was the foreign exchange market was collapsing. Prices of foreign exchange were going out faster than the domestic price. Um, so that, you know, it got to the point where one mark was, it took, let's say, 100 million marks to buy a loaf of bread domestically, but it took a billion marks to buy a franc or something like that, or a dollar. The German, German public, instead of blaming the, the bank, the reason why the foreign exchange was going down faster, was getting inflating faster than the domestic, was very simple, namely the foreign exchange market is speculative, they're looking to the future, they see that, anticipating further inflation. So they were on the cutting edge of this kind of anticipation. So uh, foreign exchange prices being very, very flexible and very, uh, very quick and so forth, and, and foreseeing can anticipate inflation better than domestic producers, uh, domestic consumers. But unfortunately, the Germans blame the foreign exchange market. So there's something evil about foreign exchange speculators that causes inflation. So therefore, when the Depression hit, 1933, 30, 30, 31, 30, 31, 32, 33, it was politically impossible for any German government to devalue the mark. It was also politically impossible to go back to the gold standard. They didn't, they didn't think in those terms. Nobody was on the gold standard anymore. That was considered Neanderthal, reactionary, and all that. The United States and England began to get hysterical very quickly. This, is, this was um, already in the Bruning administration, before Hitler took over. It was in the Bruning administration in 1932, the war began. And also when Hitler took over, they began to get totally hysterical about this, and this uh, about the fact that Germany was opting out of the international monetary system. In other words, Opting out of control by international bankers, financiers, and all the rest of it. <clears throat> um, they also claim that Germany was exploiting these countries by, by engaging in these foreign ex these barter deals. None of this is all. This is ridiculous. The, what actually was going on was that Germany was engaged. Both Germany and Romania were, had overvalued exchange, uh, currency. You know, Germany had overvalued mark, and Romania had overvalued whatever the Romanian currency is. There's the, the, the pengo. <laughs> As a result, what we happened is it was a complex deal by which the German uh, taxpayer, a consumer, was subsidizing German exports, manufactured goods, and the Romanians were subsidizing their exports, which were which was the farmers, the wheat farmers. Each one was subsidizing their own exports at the expense of their domestic consumers. So it was an elaborate deal by which uh, both sets of exporters were favored at the expense of their respective consumers. Um, at any rate, this, uh, as I say, the, the, this, this began a whole, a whole series of, uh, of uh, 
war, war-like kind of uh, attacks. And um, the uh, also Secretary Hull, when the war began, 19, when we entered the war in 1941, or shortly after that, Secretary of State Hull uh, said flat out, as he said many times, the real cause of World War II is economic. In other words, trade b- barriers, uh, financial barriers, currency blocks. And so those, current, those, those uh, countries which had the same currency block wound up on the same side of the war. So what happens then in the... Uh, in the 1930s, with, as Hoover, Hoover launches a new deal, 1939, when the, when the Depression starts, Hoover was the first New Dealer, the site that you, which you read in the textbook. Every, everything that Franklin D. Roosevelt did, every measure was initiated by Hoover, expanding uh, public work, deficits, cheap credit, keeping wage rates up by government pressure, um, uh, bailing out the uh, bankrupt, the quasi bankrupt industries through the through government lending. Reconstruction Finance Corporation, uh, high tariffs to keep out <coughs> imports, farm price support, support, the whole farm policy program really begins with Hoover. Yeah, this is the New Deal, right. Uh, Roosevelt, what Roosevelt simply did was to expand it. What happened was that um, um, the uh, Morgan, well, the, Morgan, the, 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 the businessmen like Swope and Baruch, et cetera, who wanted, you know, ask, asking for official cartelization system ever since World War I, now put pressure on Hoover to, to, to formalize it, to set up an NRA and so forth, um, which was the so-called slope plan in 1932. And the thing is, Hoover was really, was really launching the whole thing. He was one of the pioneers in, in corporatism, but he, he felt this went too far. He said, no, no, I have to make a formal system and force all uh, firms in the trade association and force them to keep their agreements. This is it's too much, too extreme. He said, my God, that's fascism. <laughs> So I don't, it took him a long time to figure that out. Of course, it was. At any rate, at that point, the big, big business types in the United States, the Chamber of Commerce and Swope, et cetera, uh, told Hoover directly, if you don't support this NRA program, we'll shift our support to Roosevelt. And then he said, I'm sorry, it's a fascism. And they did, they did shift the support to Roosevelt. And as soon as Roosevelt came in, he put, he put the Swope plan in in the form of the National Recovery Administration, NRA. Uh, with Roosevelt, we have a group of people who are the, the, the Hyde Park Roosevelt, which are close to the Astors and Harrimans, particularly the Astor family. Um, remember the Teddy, the Oyster Bay Roosevelt, from which Teddy Roosevelt comes from, was close to the Morgan. The Hyde Park Roosevelt, close to the Astor family. As a matter of fact, um, the, um, the Roosevelt and Astors were closely related to each other. There was a um, the Astors, of course, were the first family. First wealthy family in the United States, virtually. John Jacob Astor uh, got his, became a fur millionaire from the fur trade around 1820, and then invested their money in, in New York real estate. So that uh, they're probably the oldest li- living, whatever, big family, wealthy family. At any rate, Franklin Roosevelt's half brother, James Roosevelt, married a daughter of Miss, the Mrs. William Astor, who was running society here in New York for many years. And um, Warren Delano, who was, who was Roosevelt's Grand, FDR's grandfather's brother, Franklin Delano, uh, in other words, uh, the grand uncle from whom Franklin Roosevelt was named, Franklin Delano, uh, had married William Astor's sister. So we had a very close family connection between the Astors and Roosevelt. Um, and it also, also turns out that uh, Vincent Astor, not only a relative of Franklin D. Roosevelt, but a close friend, he also happened to be chairman of the board excuse me, a, a member of the board of the Chase National Bank, which used to be uh, Morgan. However, in 1930, the Rockefeller interest executed a coup d'etat, so to speak. Uh, Chase Bank merged with the bank of uh, the Equitable Life, Equitable Trust Company, which is Rockefeller. And because of that, the Rockefeller was able to seize control of the Chase Bank in 1930, after which it became a, the, the top Rockefeller bank. Albert Wigan had been the chairman of the board of Chase National Bank, who was, the, who was a Morgan person. As soon as the Rockefellers took over, they deposed Wigan about a year later, and they put in Winthrop W. Aldrich, who was uh, the son of Nelson Aldrich, and of course, cousin of John D. Rockefeller Jr. So um, uh, this symbolizes the shift. At any rate, Vincent Astor was on the board. Uh, so what we had during the 30s was we had a, a Roosevelt Astor connection. 
and also uh, an Astro Rockefeller connection, also a Roosevelt Rockefeller connection. Um, so we had a, a general alliance between the Rockefellers and the Roosevelts and the Astros and the Harrimans, another very important family, democratic family, who were also close neighbors of the Astros up, up in, up in uh, I guess it's Rockland County. It's not Rockland County, it's the county north of Rockland, or just around there. Uh, and um, so the Harrimans are W. Averill Harriman, son of the original Harriman, E. H. Harriman. Uh, it's an extremely important figure that's been o overlooked by historians and analysts. And he uh, was a good friend of Franklin Roosevelt. He, he was the, probably the most influential financial person. And of course, the Harrimans and Rockefellers and Kuhn Loeb had been allied since 1900, 1902, and still were in this period. So we had a, a Harriman Rockefeller after connection. Uh, Harriman was a um, um, head of the Business Advisory Council. Of, uh, which was set up, which he, uh, which was set up in 1933. Since Roosevelt gets in, Business Advisory Council of the Department of Commerce to be sort of a major institutional instrument, instrument for big business uh, influence. Business Advisory Council. Harriman was also, uh, uh, he was on the board of directors of Bank of Manhattan Company, which is Kuhn Loeb. Again, we have the famous Harriman Kuhn Loeb connection. And uh, they, they ran the Bank of Manhattan for many years. The Chase National Bank, later, later in the 50s or 60s, became the Chase Manhattan Bank, and thereby symbolizing a, a, a union between Rockefeller and Kuhn Loeb interests. Um, Harriman was also a close friend of Percy Rockefeller, the son of William Rockefeller. So there's a strong, in other words, you have the Harriman Rockefeller Kuhn Loeb Astor connection. Um, the. Um, Harriman and Franklin Roosevelt have been Harriman and Franklin Roosevelt have been close friends since, since childhood, and Eleanor Roosevelt, the the wife of Franklin D. Roosevelt, had been an old friend of Harriman and Harriman's sister from for for life. So they had a very close interconnection between all these people, financial and rel relative, relational and personal. Um, the uh, another important group that comes up by the late 1920s. In addition to Kuhn Loeb, who, was, who in the old days originally was about the only important German-Jewish uh, Wall Street investment, investment bankers, coming out of the late 20s are two other very important firms which are also related in many ways to the Kuhn Loeb people, namely Goldman Sachs. Uh, the main partner of Goldman Sachs Corporation was Sidney J. Weinberg, who becomes one of the most powerful people for the next 30 years. Um, it was Weinberg who had the idea of setting up the Business Advisory Council. It was Weinberg, I believe, was deputy director of the War Production Board in, 19, in World War II, and also deputy director of the War Production Board during the Korean War. So he was more or less running the system until, or helping to run the system from, from the early 30s until through the uh, 50s, at least. Um, he was on the board of directors of that zillion corporation, top corporation. And also in Ford Motor Company, when the old man died around the, after World War II, uh, his son Ethel Ford died shortly thereafter, or even maybe before Henry. And so Henry Ford II, now fairly elderly, but took over as the brilliant young chairman of the board of Ford. And that, at very, after that, they capitulated the banker interest. They, Ford always had hated the Wall Street bankers, and they kept the Ford Motor Company not only, not, was not only running it personally, but also keeping it free of banker control. Uh, well, Henry Ford II didn't have that kind of view, and so they essentially sold out to Wall Street. Uh, became, see, Ford was originally a private, private corporation. It was, it was family held. And so uh, Henry Ford II went public, realized, of course, a lot of money for, for his family because uh, you know, selling the shares to the public. And the process, uh, using Goldman Sachs and Weinberg as their as a major uh, investment banker to, to float the sale. Uh, the other big uh, uh, German, German Jewish firm coming up is the Lehm Lehman Brothers, uh, who, one of whose senior, I think his senior partner, Herbert H. Lehman, became governor of New York during the uh, famous New Deal governor uh, in New York in the, in the 1930s. Uh, so, um, so what you had is a shift of power. You notice, you notice one group I haven't mentioned in this last five, ten minutes, namely the Morgans. Where are the Morgans in all this? Well, the Morgans are sort of out. 
And as a matter of fact, the, when, who, when it looked like Roosevelt was going to be nominated by the Democratic Party in 1932, the Morgans organized a, a last-minute stop, stop Roosevelt movement on behalf of Newton D. Baker, who was the Secretary of War under Wilson, to try to stop. They didn't, they didn't trust Roosevelt. And obviously, Roosevelt was a, allied with the Rockefeller Harriman people, not with the Morgans. And so, um, and the people who organized this thing at the convention were Morgan people. Owen Young, Chairman of General Electric of Morgan Company, Melvin Trailer. First pres uh, president of the First National Bank of Chicago, Morgan Bank, and also uh, General Electric. Uh, Thomas W. Lamont, Morgan Partner. All these guys were desperately trying to stop Roosevelt uh, in 1932. And uh, <clears throat> John W. Davis, who was a Democrat and nominated in 1924 as a Morgan lawyer. And Robert Woodruff, who should be mentioned here in passing. Interesting character. Robert W. Woodruff was the founder of Coca-Cola Company, or founder of the modern Coca-Cola company. Uh, and Woodruff becomes uh, Mr. Coca-Cola. He, uh, at the age of uh, 85, he was still active. I think he just died a few years ago. He was still active about the age of 85. Uh, it, was, it was Woodruff essentially discovered or uh, approved the idea of Jimmy Carter as the presidential nominee. So they try to stop Roosevelt with that success. When, when the New Deal came in, there were, still, there were some Morgan people in it, but they tended to... They were unhappy at the nationalist policy and monetary policies of Roosevelt. They wanted a, a London Economic Conference to sort of have a worldwide financial agreement to try to do something about the currency blocks. Roosevelt torpedoed it. At that point, two of the major Morgan people quit the administration. Dean Acheson, who was a disciple of Henry Stimson, who was a Morgan person, and Louis W. Douglas, another Morgan person, uh, quit. And only came back when World War II started and was a, was a mighty coalition between all these forces. Uh, by about 1935, the Morgans believing that, that the Roosevelt are going too far in, corporate, in the corporate state doctrine, just like Hoover is believing they're going too far, along with the Hoover people formed an organization called the American Liberty League, uh, which opposed the New Deal. But did it, if, you, if you analyze Liberty League, they were pretty moderate in the sense that they, were really, they, didn't, they didn't weren't in favor of going back or on to laissez-faire. They thought that Roosevelt was being too extreme. Um, their, their man, Alf Landon, was smashed in the 1936 election, and that sort of killed the Liberty League. Um, what you had also with the Roosevelt election in 32 was the end of the fourth party, end of the fourth party system. Remember, the fourth party system uh, came in around 1896 and 1900, where the parties were no longer different ideologically after about 1900, and the Republicans were dominant. And um, the Republicans won every election except 1912, where, where the progressives split the Republican Party, and 1916, where Wilson was just barely reelected. In 1932, because of the Depression, and also because of Prohibition, what happened, by the way, I forgot to mention it. Well, maybe I did mention it. Uh, Prohibition came in finally under the cover of the war, World War I, and continued on from then on. The Republican Party was committed to it by that time, and the Southern Democrats. But the Northern Democrats, of course, and the Urban Democrats very much against it. Roosevelt pledged to repeal it, and as soon as Roosevelt gets in, he, he pushes through the Constitutional Amendment repealing the, uh, the Prohibition Amendment. So, and, by, and, and with the Great Depression and with the repeal of Prohibition, there's a big shift in political party system. The fourth political party system comes in. Now, the fifth, I should know. Let's see. This was the fourth. Um, yeah. And the fifth comes in. You know, the fifth party system comes in with the Democrats as a majority party. And the Republicans now only winning with Eisenhower, and only winning Congress for about four years. The House of Representatives of Congress only for about four years from then on. So we then get a Democratic majority party. The South plus urban Catholics um, is essentially the basis of a coalition. This, is, this continued until recently. We, right now, we're probably in a six-party system, because right now, we're, we're in a, probably in the last 10 years or so. The dimensions of which are not yet clear, but uh, basically, it seems to be in a situation where the, the Democrats win the House, and the Republicans win the president, presidential elections, and very few people are, are party members. Now, we have a huge number of independents, floating voters, probably also because of the influence of television, where people vote... I mean, first of all, it hasn't been any really ideological difference from, from a long, long time, since 1896. And second of all, um, 
with television and everything, there's much fewer party membership. Party, the party's been tremendously weakened by the, especially by the uh, alleged reforms of the 1960s and early 70s. So almost every party has primaries, and so it's very, almost impossible to get any kind of ideology in any party. So it's all sort of TV. The parties mean almost nothing. That's one of the reasons why the famous thing that happened in the Illinois primary, Democratic primary, uh, a few months ago, and the LaRouches uh, won the, uh, a nutty cult, won the uh, lieutenant governor and secretary of state post in the Democratic primary, embarrassing the Democrats enormously. Because the, the, the party system, the party machines almost, almost don't exist. But you have a sort of coalition of a bunch of crooks, really, with, with no, no kind of ideological uh, difference. So you have a, ma a mass of floating independent voters, and therefore many things more or less up for grabs. Um, in the uh, in 1930s, as things developed, uh, the Morgans began, the, as the usual, to try to ally themselves with France and England to try to crush Germany. This is uh, as, as in World War One. The Rockefellers are not interested in. in um, in war with Germany. They were interested in war with Japan. The Japanese were expanding far east, and the Rockefellers and Standard Oil were interested in oil and in rubber. And rubber and oil in Southeast Asia, both were, both were trying to expand into Southeast Asia, actually into Vietnam, as it amounts to, uh, and uh, in China. Uh, there's a famous incident in 1937, I believe, the Pan A incident, where the, the Japanese sank a Rockefeller gunboat, uh, uh, I mean Rockefeller tanker, I think it was an armed tanker, I believe, and uh, the, the Pan A up the Yangtze River, way up the Yangtze River. The question, the question is, what was a Rockefeller gunboat doing up the Yangtze River? Interesting question. Anyway, it was a big hysteria about that. And so what you had then is a, a movement for many years by the Morgans to get into war against Germany and for the Rockefellers to get into war against Japan. Um, so, for example, in the State Department, the main force for try to work out a peace with Japan was ambassador to Japan, Joseph C. Grew, who was a Morgan partner. Uh, the Rockefellers in Europe were, um, in a sense, allied with Germany. They had cartel arrangements with IG Farben, uh, patent sharing agreements and so forth. So they tended to be against, the, against any intervention in Europe. John Foster Dulles, a Standard Oil lawyer, <coughs> uh, the major, probably the major Standard Oil lawyer by the 30s, wrote a book in 1940 called War, Peace, and Change, which they, in which they, he said that they, we should look at uh, German, German uh, territorial uh, demands in Europe are rational and reasonable, and we should accommodate them. Uh, comes World War II, we have a coalition. The Morgans and the Rockefellers once again come to a mighty coalition. Uh, the Morgans get their war in Europe, and the Rockefellers get their, Rockefellers get their war in Asia. Both, both sides are happy. And so we have a mighty coalition with the Morgans pouring back into the administration, shouting hallelujah, so to speak. Uh, Simpson becomes Secretary of War, uh, and um, Atchison becomes Assistant Secretary of State. Nelson Rockefeller becomes um, um, Assistant Secretary of State in charge of Latin American affairs. And uh, so you have a mighty, I say, a mighty coalition, all these guys pouring back in. And, uh, when, the, when we emerged from World War II, we emerged with the Rockefellers as permanent, permanently dominant within this Eastern establishment. Uh, the oil has now become extremely Im even more important than before. And the, from then on, we have a situation where the Rock Morgan is essentially junior partners of the Rockefellers. The Rockefellers take over the Council of Foreign Relations, which have been launched by the Morgans. Uh, and the David Rockefeller, chairman of the board of the Chase Manhattan Bank until very recently, still the dominant force, uh, sets up a trilateral, famous trilateral society as a, as a method of having tripartite in the United States, uh, Japan, and Western Europe, uh, agreement on economic policy, which then gets pushed into the government. So you, we have to realize that the Democratic and Republican parties mean nothing anymore. The question is, which financial groups are behind which candidate? <clears throat> the parties are just hollow shells uh, to be taken over, so to speak. Uh, the, the Eisenhower administration, for example, is Rockefeller straight through, as you can see by the Dulles brothers and sister running in foreign policy. Um, the, uh, the Carter, and the Carter was a, virtually a creature of the Trilateral Commission, and therefore Rockefeller, since they were, we now have Rockefeller Morgan Alliance, There's no longer any you know, competition. Um, Carter was an unknown governor of Georgia, nobody ever heard of him. 
how is he? How did he become a big, big political candidate? I mean, he, really, nobody heard of him until about January of 1976. He was elected in 1976. How did, how did he get to be president? Well, uh, he was discovered. They wanted a southern governor. They figured southern governor would be a good thing to push now. And Terry Sanford was one possibility. And Carter was another. Woodruff, head of owner of Coca-Cola, and J. Paul Austin, chairman of the board of Coca-Cola, discovered Carter. Carter, of course, was a Georgia. Uh, actually, he's not a peanut farmer. He's a peanut wholesaler, to be, to be concrete, to be specific. And um, his buddy was Bert Lance, was in with the, with the bankers, and of course, was a Georgia banker, and they, they knew about him. He was liked by the Coca-Cola people, and they, they called him the attention of the Trilateral Commission. He then, they introduced him to David Rockefeller, the Trilateral. They liked him. They made him uh, a member of the Trilateral Commission. There's only about 50 members in the United States. It's, it's not, exactly a, you know, a, a, not exactly a common garden variety thing. Now, since, the, since the Trilateral Commission was a, it only deals with foreign and economic and political policy, they asked the people of Trilateral, how, why did you pick Carter? Because he, he said he didn't know, he admitted he knew nothing about foreign policy, nothing, nothing at all. All he knew was about Georgia peanuts. And he talked about how much he learned, how wonderful the Trilateral Commission was, how he learned everything he knew about foreign affairs from, from them. So they asked the Trilateral Commission, why did you pick Carter? They said, well, we wanted the input of a southern governor on foreign affairs. Obviously, ridiculous. He had no input. Uh, the real reason, obviously, is they wanted somebody from whom they could groom for possible presidential choice, and sure enough, they figured it was good, good material. And uh, by late 75, they began to push him for president. Uh, the, pre the publisher of Time at the time, James A. Lennon, the fourth Time magazine, was a member of the Trilateral Commission, and he put Carter on the cover at a time when nobody had heard of him, pushing Carter, a great, great guy, and so on and so on, to start the Carter boom. Carter boom largely by Trilateral members. When Carter gets in, as president, his entire cabinet, from top to bottom, was, 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 really from top down to the low, middle levels, were all members of the Trilateral Commission. Considering that there's only a few members, it's pretty remarkable. Carter himself was a trilateralist. Um, Mondale, his vice president, was a trilateralist. Uh, Bigney Brzezinski, the National Security Council advisor, was a trilateralist, as was Kissinger from the Republicans. We have a tremendous difference there, but both Kissinger and, and <laughs> And uh, Brzezinski was both trilateral. It was almost the same views in almost everything. The only difference being that Kissinger is German and, and Brzezinski is Polish. I guess that's the only uh, fairly small difference. Uh, the, second, the, the heads of the State Department, the Secretary of State was a trilateralist, uh, Cyrus Vance, and uh, almost all the people in the top level of the State Department. And, uh, but the, the major differences now are between, not between Rockefellers and Morgan, but between the Eastern establishment, which now which is basically Rockefeller, which now covers the, north, the northeast quadrant of the United States. As a matter of fact, it really covers the southeast, too. So it's, in other words, New York, Illinois, Michigan, and even down, in, even Georgia would be part of the eastern establishment at this point. Um, the, the, this is one group, one, one financial political group. The other big financial political group is this, what's on the southern rim, uh, which is headquartered in Los Angeles, uh, Texas, and Florida, and by Southern Rim. There are differences in style and differences in content between these. The issues. They're both more or less similar in views, basic political economic viewpoint. The Eastern establishment has to be very cultured, it's old money, of course. They've gone to Groton and um, George Bush, for example, is a beautiful example of that. Even though, well, like George Bush is really, of course, a Texan oil man, but he was born in Connecticut. His father was a Connecticut senator and then moved to Texas. He's a peculiar combination of both. At any rate, uh, Eastern establishment people are preppies, tend to be preppies, went to Yale or Princeton or Harvard, and also tend to buy, buy, their, buy their opponents out, use money power. They're familiar with this. They buy out Columbia, Harvard, the State Department. Kissinger, for example, is just a simple assistant professor, associate professor at Harvard before Nelson Rockefeller discovered him, and made Kissinger his foreign policy advisor on permanent payroll, <coughs> even though he's only governor of New York. You wouldn't think that the government of New York would need a foreign policy, a permanent foreign policy advisor. Anyway, so essentially buying out Columbia, Harvard, et cetera, et cetera, setting up institutes for foreign relations or Russian studies institutes or whatever. The Eastern established method is thereby there um, uh, through purchase co-optation of, of enemies. The, uh, the Southern Rim, of, you know, these are known as the, Yan as the Yankees. The Southern Rim, also known as the Cowboys, tend to be slightly more in favor of free markets, not, not very much, but slightly more, slightly more in favor of war, international war, though not very much, 
and also tend to shoot their opposition rather than buy them out. The cowboys tend to be tend to be less in favor of intellectual opinion, less in favor of free speech, more in favor of shooting the opposition. Sort of a cowboy type. Uh, that's why I think Yankees and cowboys is a great term for these people. Lyndon Johnson is the quintessential quintessential cowboy, as would be John Connolly of Texas. Uh, Nixon came from Los Angeles, makes him a cowboy. Reagan came from Los Angeles, makes him a cowboy. Uh, Florida, nobody's come from it except Baby Rebozo, the famous uh, Cuban emigre, close friend of Nixon, also involved with all sorts of possible rum, 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 rum running deals. So uh, cowboys tend more toward illegal action, sort of that way, uh, executive action is <laughs> on the CIA. So if you look at it from this perspective, then you see that, for example, uh, Kennedy would, would have been, Eisenhower, of course, was Eastern Establishment. Kennedy was Eastern Establishment, uh, almost a quintessential Yankee. And uh, Johnson was a cowboy. And so we could then have the, the, Nick, the Johnson, Nick, you have Kennedy, you have Yankee. Yankee would be Eisenhower and Kennedy, you know, the different parties. And then we have uh, Johnson, would be cowboy. And Nixon, cowboy. Ford was really Yankee because Ford comes from Michigan, is in the Eastern Establishment. And Reagan, Carter, also a Yankee, and then Reagan, a cowboy. So this makes, for example, on this one, this, you're looking at it this way. You don't look at the political parties; you look at their financial backing. And the Kennedy, the Kennedy assassination then has an interesting new light on the Kennedy assassination, namely possibility, possibility of a of a cowboy takeover through assassination, because the effect of the assassination was Johnson, of course, coming to power. Um, and if you look at it as a police act, a police measure, as a police problem, usually if somebody is killed, you look at the beneficiary, the you know, the suffering widow, maybe suffering widow just bumped the guy off with $100 million or whatever. In this case, <laughs> possibly bumped them off for power and whatever wealth goes along with it. Um, and uh, the bringing, bringing down of Nixon and Watergate, and shifting to Ford, might well have been the counterattack by the, by the Eastern establishment, using not, 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 not the guns and weapons, but the power of the press, namely CBS, the Washington Post, etc., bringing down Nixon as a sort of revenge motive, for one thing, yes, for, for the Kennedy assassination, and bringing Ford in. Uh, all this very interesting spe speculation should be dove more into, which, of course, is not being done much.